Well, welcome everyone to our third keynote of this, um, this uh, digital symposium. I hope everyone has had a, a wonderful symposium. Um, we are very glad and um, honored to have Dr. Uh, Tomas Peter Sabo um, to deliver our third keynote uh, this afternoon. Uh, Dr. Sabo is a senior researcher in multilingualism, an adjunct professor of linguistic landscapes, and a scientific manager for Fortham Lab Actions in the Department of Teacher Education at the University of Uvascula in, fin in Finland. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Sabo a little over five years ago at a conference at the University of California, Berkeley on linguistic landscapes. And since then I've been following his work closely on multilingualism, linguistic landscapes, um, and, and specifically in schoolscapes, which I think uh, Dr. Sabo will be sharing with us today um, with his keynote address entitled Toward the Renewal of Practices for Multilingualism, Applying a Schoolscape Approach in International Teacher Education Courses. Uh, Tomas, it's great to see you again. Thank you for being here. And with that, I will let you start your keynote. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Steve and, uh, and Osman for, uh, for inviting and, and having me here. This has been a, a wonderful day uh, since, since morning and uh, there's been so many, um, so many inspiring talks and, and panels. So I really appreciate this opportunity that I can share uh, some, uh, some thoughts with you. So uh, actually, I've noticed uh, while, while listening to the, the various um, presentations that there's some overlap, <laughs> some significant overlap, for example, with the two other keynotes, uh, which is uh, not a surprise, I think, uh, because uh, we study the, the same field and, and uh, similar um, solutions have been found and, and uh, similar questions are uh, relevant to, to all the uh, all the presenters of, uh, of this wonderful uh, symposium. Uh, so actually, um, first I would like to show you the, the structure of, um, of this talk of, uh, of mine. Uh, so first I would uh, like to uh, share some thoughts about uh, a spatial understanding of learning environments. And this will be the part which will have the most overlap with, with other talks. And then um, would like to share some experiences, practical experiences from international pre and in service teacher education courses, which focus on schoolscapes. And these will come from three contexts, from my university's uh, Juliet program, from an Erasmus project, and from a first generation universe, European Universities Alliance called for them. But first, uh, about uh, a spatial understanding of uh, learning environments. And as you, as you uh, might have noticed, I have a virtual background. Uh, Dave Malinowski, in his uh, wonderful keynote, uh, has emphasized the notion of desire, that we have the desire to return to the uh, places that we once inhabited. And I also have the desire to... <laughs> Uh, to, to go back to, uh, to the campus. Uh, we have a wonderful campus in, in Uvescula and in, uh, in my video background, you can, you can see the main hall of, uh, uh, of the main building of our uh, university uh, designed by Alvar Alto. And I actually put lots of pictures about uh, the campus uh, uh, from Uvescula uh, to, to express this desire to, <laughs> to, to go back actually. So starting with, with the notions of, of landscapes, um, um, as uh, it was also mentioned in the, in the previous keynotes, uh, landscapes can be uh, defined as uh, some kind of sceneries, uh, which we observe from a lookout point. So here's, uh, here's the uh, area where I live, it's, it's Uvescula, and uh, here you can see the district court, uh, court depot here where I currently live, and uh, the lookout point is Lyavori Hill, where uh, there's uh, fantastic opportunities for, uh, for uh, excursions. 
So I would like to uh, share you a task uh, that I use in some of my courses, not only in Schoolscape courses, but also, for example, in ethnography and other uh, methods courses and in pedagogical courses. Uh, it's usually a kind of icebreaking um, task when there's a new group of students and uh, then I ask them to pair up with somebody they don't know very well and to introduce uh, their pair a place or area which you which they know well and which is meaningful for them and then they can tell uh, what they can see hear smell feel uh, in the place uh, that uh, that they present and also they reflect on communication practices and as uh, several of the of the very interesting talks in this uh, symposium I also uh, encourage my students to use uh, Google Maps even if there's a um, session on campus but uh, that's a, that's a great uh, tool to explore distant environments and as you can see the reference to the previous two uh, keynotes uh, Similar ideas have been used, but I still uh, decided to keep this intro because I think that maybe my focus is slightly different. So for example, if I take the picture that I've just shown to you, uh, what would be my answers? Uh, I, I would, for example, share more sensory accounts on, on, on this environment. For example, that I really can use all the senses when I walk in the forest, kind of uh, listening to, to birds and enjoying the, the warm, for example, in a summer day and, uh, and sensing the, the ground uh, in my light shoes, for example. Uh, so these are all, all the experiences that are related to this uh, wonderful environment. Uh, I can, and also others can uh, in this task, share uh, various narratives. So uh, these various landscapes uh, are full of stories and people make sense of these landscapes through, through narratives. For example, I could uh, tell uh, to somebody if I was the student who gets this task that okay how it has been to build a new life in a, in a new country uh, since I've moved uh, to Finland seven years ago. Also, uh, feelings of belonging and non-belonging, how, uh, how people relate to the environment they, they inhabit, they explore, they experience. And I could, for example, say that uh, in, in my different roles and identities, uh, sometimes I feel very strong uh, belonging and sometimes I, I don't. And I could then maybe give examples which, uh, which areas or which uh, spaces or which uh, kind of uh, groups uh, I belong to, to various extents. And of course, because you're all, we are all interested in languages and actually I could may even say languaging, so the various ways of communicating. Uh, I could also uh, tell about the uh, my perceptions of the languages. For example, I could tell as part of the narrative of building a new life in a new country, how my uh, linguistic practices have, uh, have changed from be being a person knowing Hungarian as native language and, and English and French as uh, languages uh, studied in school and how uh, kind of I've built uh, my, my Finnish skills. Uh, slowly in, in so-called real life encounters and how I ended up teaching and, and uh, primarily working in, uh, in Finnish uh, in, in my current situation. So all, all these things uh, actually make it, I, I would agree that, uh, I would uh, argue that uh, uh, these, this task, for example, makes it easier to reflect on the, on the landscapes and these reflections also uh, help to, to reveal various connections uh, among peoples and, and groups and, and various uh, languaging practices. There's another one. And uh, again, I uh, refer back to, to Dave Malinowski's uh, plenary, but uh, still I kind of show my own version of, of, of the task she, uh, he uh, presented. So um, especially now that we have this desire of the spaces that we <laughs> can't use, um, temporarily um, but also when we are on campus I ask the students to close their eyes and imagine that they are in the primary or secondary school again and the uh, the purpose of this task is that uh, I've noticed from my personal practices and of course the literature has also shown that uh, uh, that pre-service teachers and also in-service teachers quite often build on uh, 
the practices that they've experienced as learners when they actually teach. So those, those uh, experienced practices uh, influence their pedagogies quite, uh, quite clearly. So when, when we think about uh, the spatial practices of educators, it's very uh, important to think about those previous practices that have shaped our understanding of, of learning environments. So there are questions such as where are you uh, in your imagined past uh, environment, uh, what objects surround you, how does it feel to be there both kind of physically and, and emotionally, what would you like to do, what the space encourages you to do, and what can you do? So are there kind of things that are, are restricted that you can't do, or are there some rules or, or regulations also through, through spatial practices? And the way of doing these tasks is, is, uh, is also to, uh, to talk about this. And I have a great colleague, Anne Martin, who, uh, who has helped me to develop a kind of creative writing aspect of this. So, so uh, the students can also write about this in a creative way, but they can also uh, bring images uh, from various contexts and then interpret them uh, using the previous questions. So on the left, uh, there are images from my field work in Hungary. Uh, and on the right, there's an image from my fieldwork in Finland. So actually you can see these various contexts that uh, enhance and restrict uh, actions in, in various ways uh, from, for example, teacher dominant uh, uh, frontal uh, teaching to, uh, to um, working on projects uh, on, on uh, bean bags and also kind of including these well-being elements of the classrooms like the relaxation corner of one of the schools. And also you can see those uh, symbolic signs that uh, the flags uh, on, on one of the pictures, uh, which kind of associate uh, foreign languages with nation states. And in a way, implicitly, they send the message that those languages belong somewhere else. <laughs> so because the classroom is from Hungary, one might think that, okay, if I uh, study uh, German, for example, uh, then I, I learn it because if I go to Germany, then it will be useful, even though, of course, German is a global language, as English is, and also as Italian and French and others are also uh, global languages, but still there's this very important, very kind of uh, st strong uh, ideology of, uh, of uh, allocating uh, languages to, to nation states. But if we move out of the classroom, as we, as we often do, uh, we can look around in the surrounding. Um, I usually use a um, method, which uh, I wrote about in the, in the paper with uh, Rob Troyer. Uh, this uh, walking uh, tour uh, method, this uh, tourist guide uh, technique, that's, that's how I uh, call, but it could be also walking into you and you can call it by various names. So I, uh, I asked somebody to uh, guide me around uh, on, on premises or also outside of premises. And then they tell uh, me some insider information about the meaningful places uh, that are linked to their school practices. For example, above you can uh, see uh, images that are uh, linked to uh, pupils, uh, pupils walking to the school. So those are the village environments. Those are not school premises, but still that's part of the school experience, what, what uh, way you get to the school. And also in the, in the bottom, you can see the student restaurant and also the vendor machine uh, as places of gathering and informal exchange and also the sports ground of uh, which, which can relate to uh, extracurricular uh, hobbies, but also uh, to curricular activities like uh, PE uh, classes. So summing up all these things, uh, one can say that learning takes place, of course, everywhere and anywhere. It depends on how you use those environments. Uh, but in teach education, quite naturally, uh, there's most emphasis on custom design learning environments, such as schools, museums, libraries, playgrounds, and other, uh, and other uh, environments, and also planned activities in non-custom design learning environments. For example, going to the forest, which is uh, clearly not uh, designed for learning, but you can learn a lot of things by exploring, for example, the nature and also the city walking tours. Of course, shopping streets are not uh, designed for learning, but as we could see in various very inspiring talks uh, today, uh, you can use them in, in multiple ways to, uh, to, to learn and teach various languages. 
So a big question uh, re re related to schoolscapes, how to enhance learning experiences uh, in le identity safe learning environments, which are places to belong and learn, where people can be their own and then can learn in their own pace and where their uh, uh, linguistic resources, for example, are acknowledged, etc. So what I've followed in my in my practice of uh, of designing these cor courses that I will talk about, uh, I found it very important to reflect systematically on the landscape and linguistic landscape as part of pedagogical practices to be conscious about this. And it's wonderful to see that several presenters, uh, so all, all of the presenters, of course, of this, this symposium are very conscious <laughs> because the examples that they've shown are, are, are very creative and interesting. So. Uh, also making connections be uh, between learners lived environment so not to uh, handle for example school as a, as a separate uh, environment uh, but making uh, connections like organizing activities outside the, the school premises or inviting people from other institutions to the school also building on language resources that are used at uh, the learners home etc so to kind of uh, Break, uh, break the division between these environments or deconstruct the walls, one, one could say. And also what I have found very interesting uh, is building design skills to use the environment as resource. And I can say that most of the time the, the participants of the courses uh, say that this uh, has been quite a novelty to them, you know, that they, they are also designers, they are not only teachers, but they are also designers of learning environments. Uh, and also the, the whole uh, kind of change of focus from, for example, teaching verbal skills and writing skills to this kind of holistic understanding of, uh, of uh, using various virtual or physical learning environments is, is quite quite a revelation uh, often to the to the participants. So schoolscape, I know that you you've done a lot, all of you uh, in the in the field of schoolscape, but still some definitions. So of course, schoolscape research existed long before the born of the uh, of the term, uh, for example, uh, educational anthropologists uh, such as Norik Brock Johnson uh, worked a lot on the materialization of cultural values and they've written a lot about, for example, hidden curriculum, which is expressed by various spatial and material practices. Cara Brown uh, has coined the term schoolscape in 2005 in her seminal paper, uh, saying that schoolscape is the physical and social setting in which teaching and learning take place. So you can see that it's quite a wide definition. And being more uh, specific later, Cara Brown has uh, stated that in schoolscapes, text, sound, images, and artifacts constitute, reproduce, and transform language ideologies. So quite often they actually strengthen already existing language ideologies, like you said in the, uh, in the, in the flags of the nation states, uh, kind of uh, strengthening the message that uh, uh, languages belong to states, but they can also transform language ideologies. For example, if you uh, display some languages that uh, that uh, the pupils had um, used at home, but they had not been uh, languages of instruction. Um, they they transform language ideologies. Uh, the displays in the, in the schoolscape can tr transform ideologies that, okay, those languages are also valuable and those languages are also uh, good for, uh, for learning. Uh, so one can learn on those languages. And for example, Menkel and, uh, and colleagues have a fantastic uh, findings from a project in New York State where, where so-called my, so minoritized languages have been introduced to uh, schools and then it, uh, it has enhanced uh, uh, their visibility in the schoolscape and also the learning outcomes. So of course schoolscape uh, research uh, has uh, handled uh, all these kind of issues uh, and I would like to uh, call your attention to a special issue of linguistics and education uh, where also some of the people I've already mentioned uh, such as uh, Cara Brown and also uh, Steve Primus uh, has uh, published very very exciting papers. So the, the context uh, I just uh, can say that for example the urban semiotic context ca caused the attention to uh, 
the importance of not separating home environments and, and school environments, for example. Also the diachronic change, there have been fantastic talks in, in this symposium about changes in various uh, uh, schoolscape, for example. Um, and uh, so how some, some languages disappear and, and reappear, etc. cetera. For, uh, for example, there was now this afternoon a paper about uh, uh, about uh, pre-COVID and during COVID situation, how it uh, rearranges the visibility of languages with uh, uh, with uh, certain language choices, and also ecological approaches to hybrid environments. Of course, not, uh, nowadays we all work in hybrid environments and uh, mainly virtual these COVID times, and also various uh, pedagogical aspects such as uh, language immersion, content and language integrated learning, that is uh, CLIL, and sign language education uh, are, are quite interesting. And also various uh, qualitative, um, various uh, methodological choices are present in the studies, uh, the quantitative analysis, counting signs and, and their um, and their message about the uh, language visibility and language dominance, and also several qualitative um, studies. And as Dave Malinowski has emphasized in his uh, keynote, uh, these uh, methodological choices clearly can be connected to various uh, linguistic landscape uh, uh, kind of study directions. So uh, that he called uh, linguistic landscape uh, 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, etc. So then, then there's also this kind of development uh, that one can track back. So now I think it's it's time, and I just look at my clock. Yeah. So uh, now it's time to um, talk about some. Uh, in-service and pre-service teacher uh, education courses and I would like to express my gratitude to my wonderful colleagues in the various uh, teaching programs and also the most wonderful students who've uh, who've contributed to the development of these uh, of these uh, programs because without them nothing <laughs> would have been possible so this is a kind of chart summarizing uh, the genesis of uh, of various um, courses I've code developed. Uh, the Everything uh, began with a course uh, which is currently called Language in Learning Environments. It had a different name earlier, but now it's Language in Learning Environments, and I'm quite happy with this general uh, title. Uh, and then from this, I've co-developed an in-service teacher education module in the project Everyday Creativity uh, in English, and then another one uh, for um, school principles that was in Finnish and funded by the Finnish National a Agency for Education and the pre-service education uh, shared course is now in the making in a Fordham Alliance. Anything that I do uh, is in a uh, tight connection uh, with the teacher education curriculum of my university which uh, focuses on these seven skills in, in all of the subjects. And for example, the ethical skill in Schoolscape uh, course uh, would mean that uh, that we uh, consider so future teachers, for example, uh, consider um, students and and pupils uh, and various uh, learners of various age as agents who have the who have their preferences and who can have an impact on uh, uh, on uh, Schoolscapes. Also, the cultural, communal, and societal skills would mean uh, a, a focus on the understanding of the histories of the learners, what kind of culture they bring with themselves to the to the classroom, and how those could be uh, uh, kind of uh, handled in a, in a dialogue, how they could uh, establish a dialogue, and also communication and interactional skills with special regard to the diversity. I've also uh, been developing a, a program called Language Aware Multilingual Pedagogy, which especially calls teachers' attention to uh, rely on uh, pupils' uh, language resources in whatever they do. So the first course, Language in Learning Environments, uh, is part of uh, our university's uh, Juliet program, which calls Uvascular University Language Innovation and Educational Theory program, and it has been launched in 2017. And this program gives students the opportunity to specialize in English and to develop the expertise in foreign language pedagogy for younger learners. And it's a, it's a class teacher uh, education and, and subject teacher education uh, program. And domestic, international, and exchange students attend. And it's quite a, 
popular program and uh, as uh, as you know a memory from from berkeley you can see a very very crowded <laughs> uh bo info board uh, from from berkeley university so uh there are lots of things that we we handle in this course uh, but for example uh understanding organizational cultures is one key uh, issue and also methods how to uh, study schoolscapes uh interactional studies and also community planning that's quite uh, quite important uh, from the aspect sorry from the aspect of uh, of a learner's involvement that uh, you have some skills how to involve them into into co-design and also uh, architecture so school design uh, and architecture aspects are quite often a novelty to these students because they study education but they don't study architecture and usually they are quite positively surprised how interesting architecture can be from a schoolscape point of view um, and the main aims of the course is to critically study and uh, reflect on uh, physical learning environments and also on virtual. That's why the physical is in brackets. And uh, build method methodological tools and strategies for pedagogical uh, purposes. And there are lots of activities, uh, for example, reflection tasks, uh, multimodal reflection tasks. Also, the students. Uh, wanted uh, reading circles to get a better understanding of the of the linguistic landscape literature which is sometimes quite novel and quite demanding to them so we have reading circle they also work on literature review to prepare their project work because uh, uh, this is a project-based course and for example there's a design workshop uh, which is built on the principles of design thinking so that you first need to understand what people need, you need to identify some, some challenges and then to, to map the situation, map people's needs, work together with them to develop a prototype then test the prototype and then continue this um, evolution of the idea with, with, with reiteration of the process. Uh, because once you found a good solution for a problem, quite, uh, um, um, quite surely you will bump into other uh, problems that you again need to solve and there are uh, group project topics based on the students interests and as you can see there are lots of and very interesting uh, topics there from designing cost efficient solutions so which means that sometimes people say that okay we can't do fancy things because we don't have money for new equipment or furniture etc but actually with rearranging already existing resources you can you can uh, launch pedagogical innovation and also there are quite specific projects for example the effects of wall color on children in the classroom that's a wonderful review that the teachers had worked on and of course uh, there are these very very timely challenges like let's be prepared for online education in COVID times which is from from this iteration of the course so now I will continue with two courses that uh, have emerged from from this kind of basic course the one is uh, course in uh, within the project of uh, everyday creativity. So um, when we started to work on this uh, project, it was clear that we need to uh, approach uh, learning from a creative uh, and from an ecological uh, ecological point of view, and to concern consider all kinds of elements such as uh, processes of education, all kinds of products of the educational process such as curriculum and 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 staff and also partnerships between different uh, uh, stakeholders both internally and externally also the physical environment which was my focus and ex internal and external policies and university of us school was uh, charge of developing this uh, course i uh, i led the team with uh, christoph Fenvesi. Uh, and then uh, we had uh, partner schools and NGOs and entrepreneurs from uh, from four countries, Romania, Hungary, Italy and the Netherlands. And as you can see, this kind of multi-stakeholder co-creation uh, co uh, has proved to be very exciting, not only because the various uh, backgrounds of the stakeholders uh, arriving from uh, from schools and from business uh, kind of management, etc. And also uh, the national context uh, has increased uh, diversity 
because all, all these countries mentioned have different language uh, education uh, policies and also education policies in general and education systems, etc. So uh, there were five thematic modules based on a serve, um, of a survey uh, of needs assessment of future participants. So we ended up with these five uh, uh, modules and one of them was developing learner-centered indoor and outdoor environments and that was the schoolscape element and that's what I will talk about more in detail. So we followed a blended um, approach so there were online assignments at home in this case it was stories of redesigning learning environments so these teachers uh, have mapped uh, what kind of uh, changes in their schoolscape have happened and then school visits uh, and on-site on workshops organized in Uveskule and then follow up after the teachers uh, traveled back to their uh, home and uh, continued working in their schools. They tried out uh, some innovations and also organized workshops for their colleagues. So there were 20 um, teachers, uh, five from each country and when they went home uh, they organized the uh, workshops for at least 10 teachers per person so we reached at least 200 uh, teachers with this training so uh, the, the, I just want would like to give you an example of concrete example how this uh, went uh, so I will follow the structure of pre-task the visit in Uveskula with the workshops and the follow-up project in the in the home uh, environment in the home school so this was the first task, uh, stories of redesigning learning environments. What would be your pedagogical challenge that you would like to share? Have you found a solution? Are you experimenting with something new? Do you plan to change something? Then in a short video. And uh, we have the permission to, to use these videos uh, with the participants own name and, uh, and, email, uh, and, and faces visible, etc. So I'm very happy to share this video with you. And this is uh, quite quiet. So you might want to adjust the audio. Hi, I'm Anna. And I teach French language in this secondary school. As you can see, this is an old school in an old building. They are more than 100 years old and uh, there are traditional classrooms and narrow corridors inside. And I think this environment is not too inspiring. This is one challenge for me and I have another challenge. My students know much more uh, American culture and English speaking countries than other cultures, for example, France or French culture. So I decided to change. That's why I create a, a new learning area. This is our French classroom, here it is. And I wanted to create a more familiar, a more colorful learning environment, which is inspiring and encouraging. And I wanted to present the, hung, uh, the French culture, sorry, the countryside, uh, the popular culture, and uh, some uh, everyday expressions and a little bit of history. So, here it is. So I hope you could uh, hear it okay. Uh, so actually, uh, what she uh, defined as a, a pr um, kind of a initial challenge is that uh, French is not motivating enough, so something should be done uh, with the learning environment. And by associating French with, uh, with France, uh, she has redesigned this uh, this classroom, adding several visual elements and and references to to the history and, and culture of France. So that was that was her solution, and uh, that's what that's what she actually uh, shared with with the other participants. Uh, during their school visits, uh, the the teachers worked in in different uh, uh, different groups. Uh, they um, worked on five modules as you could see earlier the five modules of the of the course uh, they were divided by the, the um, modules and uh, one person from each country contributed to to each uh, group so and uh, Agnes uh, was also a member in the 
a learning environment module group and when they wrote their portfolio uh, collaboratively they uh, arrived to the conclusion that creative environment is the combination of seen and unseen values created through human interaction that is it is not the built environment the equipment or the furniture that counts but rather how people use whatever environment and treat each other so i think that that's that's quite quite a fantastic takeaway message that you can say that okay i don't have such fancy educational tools etc but but actually what counts is how you use those whatever <laughs> tools and and how you involve uh the learners and how to how to treat other people uh and empower them and involve them for example in the designing process and one example that's why this is the kitchen image that there's a so-called home economy course in finland where uh, it's very popular the, the pupils uh, uh, learn how to uh, prepare food and for example that was a that was a central uh example in this portfolio that okay while they are uh, preparing the food they practice so many things. For example, they cook from, from recipes in different languages and then they really need to collaborate and they need to um, serve it to each other. So, so it's, it's, it was a kind of essential example of, of uh, people treating each other well. <laughs> and actually this can, this can be a, a message from language learning. And as you uh, remember, Agnes uh, kind of focused on uh french and france in in the visual design of her classroom but uh actually she has expanded her understanding of of schoolscapes that for example she said that uh i think that design and communicative spaces at school is not only about interior design but a lot more i would like the students students to experience that they are able to influence their everyday surroundings they can use uh, old uh, places in new ways. They can take responsibility why they design and uh, they can work in group, which is more powerful. So I, I think that she arrived to a very interesting general uh, conclusion and understanding of uh, how uh, schoolscape design can be a, a developing kind of uh, pedagogical process and why it could be very important. And as you can see in this slide, I uh quote for, from quote her words from a published handbook which can be seen here so that's what i co-edited with christoph Engel, she gomati sandra raj and thea kangasvieri and uh, we included not only the materials that uh, we've developed in our teaching team but also uh, participating teachers follow-up projects and other uh, reflections in a shortened way so the teachers are co-authors of the handbook and they appear with their real names etc so that uh, i think that it's 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 great to also to give uh, credit to them and uh, it's uh, published in five languages the languages uh, english and the common language of the project and the um, languages uh, associated with the participating countries so finally, I would like to share some insights about another international pre-service teacher education course, uh, which uh, has been developed in uh, the Fordham Alliance uh, and more specifically in the Multilingualism in School and Higher Education Lab that I've been uh, coordinating together with Petri Laihonen. And uh, this course will go to a digital academy platform which, uh, of which I will tell more. So for them uh, stands for fostering outreach within European regions, transnational higher education and mobility, and it's a first generation European Universities Alliance since uh, last year. Uh, the participating universities, there are seven universities from Finland, uh, Latvia, uh, Germany, Poland, uh, France, uh, Spain and Italy. Uh, you can see on our logo where they are located uh, and uh, we develop long-term strategic collaboration in education and research and as part of the educational collaboration uh, and also the research collaboration we have challenging used multidisciplinary expert networks called Foden Labs and I'm the uh, scientific manager of these labs uh, all of the labs uh, at, at the alliance level uh, so these labs are expert networks that focus on some challenges, societal challenges, and they are composed of students, academics, associated partners from outside the universities. And there are altogether seven dedicated topics, seven labs, 
and currently four to five hundred contributors work on different projects, different outputs. And the Schoolscape course has been developed uh, in the Fordham Multilingualism in School and Higher Education Lab because it focuses on the societal challenge of multilingualism. So actually, uh, in this collaboration, uh, we integrate several educational contexts, for example, from kindergarten to university, and national contexts, for example, the seven countries that uh, the participants are from, and the stakeholder groups, such as the academics, the students, and for example, in this case, uh, practicing teachers from local schools, uh, take part in development. Also, uh, there are shared tutoring sessions planned, for example, uh, master's thesis uh, workers can uh, get uh, tutoring and supervision from another university as well. That's quite interesting and enriching. Uh, in the planned course, uh, there's modular structure for flexibility and the platform, uh, which is Moodle based, uh, will be the digital academy, which will be uh, open for all the member universities. And as we hope, there will be seamless integration of the various courses of these universities. And I really do hope that. And actually, there are um, experiments that show that, yeah, it's, it, it seems to be quite, uh, quite well working. So what, what kind of uh, components this new course would have? And actually it's a summary of, of all the previous other courses. So it's a kind of lessons learned from previous courses have been uh, worked into this plan. So in the core, there are pre-recorded lectures and pre and post assignments to enhance reflection and learning. So the lectures are like uh, 20 minutes long and they are not only produced by academics, but also by students. For example, if a student, uh, a pre-service teacher student uh, works on a specific interesting master's thesis topic, which is linked to school scapes, then he or she is most welcome to develop materials. Uh, I have an intern at this moment who will work, for example, on early childhood education context, uh, uh, and then also a supervisee of mine who will work on arts education and so on. So the students will also contribute to the course development in this way or the development of uh, course materials. And of course, all the materials are peer reviewed anyway by the members of the team. So they, they will be of, of very good quality, I'm, I'm quite sure. Uh, links to these uh, core activities, there are moderated or self-organized reading circle for the, for the students. And then in another block, uh, there's project work, individual reading, and also group work on a project. Uh, so actually these are different levels of understanding the topic, going deeper and deeper in understanding a more complexly, uh, in a more complex way, you know, how, how schoolscapes work and how they can be designed. And as you can see on the left, uh, we want to adapt uh, these modules uh, for a system of micro-credentials so that those who don't want or cannot uh, complete the whole course uh, then uh, could uh, complete some parts of it and then uh, and then they could get a certificate for that or oh, actually now we are thinking of uh, digital uh, badges so there would be several topics uh, there would be some core lectures core topics and then lots of other things on offer it would be like a library of videos or a repository uh, of, of tasks and videos and materials and then we hope that uh, students can benefit and at this point it will be piloted uh, in a fully virtual setting uh, next year but we hope that there will be also blended uh, iteration of it so that uh, the students would be able to to uh, move physically from one university to another to wrap up uh, I would like to, with this whole talk uh, and this contribution to this uh, wonderful uh, symposium, I, I wanted to emphasize that the Schoolscape approach, the Schoolscape lens, if you like, be it a spatial, multisensory and embodied understanding of learning. And such an understanding, hopefully, if everything goes well, promotes inclusive, learner-friendly and multilingual learning environments at various levels of education from early childhood education till higher education. And I do believe that uh, international multi-stakeholder collaboration, such as in the Everyday Creativity Project and in Fordham Labs, um, in various ways 
uh, enhances dialogic learning culture. We have different backgrounds, both professionally and in our national context, so we enrich each other. Uh, such collaboration also provides resources for continuous course development. So, for example, if uh, students or collaborating teachers or academics come up with new ideas, their new lectures can be added to the course and then the whole database becomes richer. And such multi-stakeholder collaboration sets ground for research collaboration as well, because why not doing research on how this kind of um, schoolscape education works in teach education? I'm quite uh, sure that this would be a valid topic for several researchers of, uh, of education. And I personally would like to carry out such a research in the near future. And finally, uh, some piece of landscape from, from Uvescula, from the end of the street where I live. So I do hope that uh, in the future you will, you will be able to come to, to Uvescula and explore this beautiful environment. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tomas. Um, that was so interesting in your, your research. It's such comprehensive and um, uh, important breadth of scope for teacher education. Uh, you've, you've done so many things. I have, um, my mind is going crazy with all the collaborations that I want to do with you and connect my students. In a future presentation, I'd like to see um, my university as one of those listed there, <laughs> collaborating with your students at Uvascula. Um, I, have, I have questions and I would like to invite others. I'm looking at the time here and Dr. Solmas, you can sort of direct us as well. I think we have at least 10 minutes or around there uh, to ask you some questions. Um, and we have a Q and A that I will keep my eye on. I'll also try to keep my eye on the chat, but I'll just start off with a question, uh, Tomas. And, <clears throat> and that's, I, I zeroed in on a comment you made about Te uh, pre-service teacher and in-service teacher and even students agency. And I love that because I think when we talk about the linguistic landscape and schoolscapes, a lot of times people's response to that is we're passive with our environment, that the environment acts on us. We, um, and indeed it does. There's some great research on new materialism um, and thing power, but we are also agents. And, and I'm wondering if you can maybe share, not to put you too much on the spot, but maybe share a concrete example of after having led a course on this and those um, project inquiry students do, that you saw your students go out and actually use their agency to change a schoolscape. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for this, uh, this question and uh, answering your first comment. You are most welcome to contribute. Actually, in, in uh, Fordham Alliance, it's possible to collaborate with the Alliance external partners. And it's very good that now you ask because now I have the occasion to, uh, to tell that uh, I have wonderful colleagues who also contribute to this uh, school development uh, from the University of uh, Hamburg and the University of Helsinki. And they are not uh, Fordham member universities, but it's still possible so uh, your, your university is most welcome as well and about this agency I think that uh, what is uh, always very encouraging is that uh, for example in, in a master's program if a first year student take the course then it uh, now it happened uh, that uh, that uh, some of them chose uh, schoolscapes as their um, master's thesis topic and then uh, and then uh, they uh, are planning to uh, carry out uh, action research so for example in some in some context uh, primary education or, or um, early childhood education etc and they they see how the uh, how changes of the uh, of the schoolscape uh, kind of uh, 
impacts education in various settings. So there's one about uh, translanguaging, how to enhance uh, translanguaging in educational contexts uh, with, uh, with co-designing the schoolscape with the learn young learners. And there's another one about arts education. And uh, so these, these are quite interesting. So that's, that's how it kind of grows that, uh, that uh, some, some uh, students uh, do their master's thesis. And also sometimes uh, our alumni uh, reach out to me and then they say that, okay, I started working here and here. And then could I uh, share some, some new uh, resources, etc. because they would like to uh, experiment with something. So that's, that's also, I think uh, for, for most of, so, so, so several of uh, students find this uh, quite, quite useful. And also in the in service uh, or the yeah the in service uh, program this uh, everyday creativity some uh, weeks ago i just uh, got feedback that uh, although the project is over that uh, ended uh, last year in november uh, but still uh, participants uh, keep using the materials and get inspiration for for their activities in their primary and secondary schools Thank you. I invite our participants to drop a question in the chat or the Q&A function as well. I have another, I have another question, Tomas, that's kind of a follow-up question. I think when we dive into linguistic landscapes and schoolscapes, it's important to also have a critical eye on um, Definitely observing what goes well, but also observing maybe the pitfalls of what could go bad. Um, and I'll just a quick example. I, I as well do research with uh, schoolscapes here in the U.S. state of Texas, and I've gone into classrooms before, um, maybe Spanish language, foreign language classrooms, where the schoolscape on the classroom are, is very stereotypical about the Mexican culture. Um, and I will oftentimes have to talk with teachers and students and say, you know, that doesn't really represent authentically the Mexican culture. It, it, it's, it's very much a stereotype. Um, and maybe we could think about different ways of representing that. And I wonder if, if you've um, had conversations I've had to have conversations with pre-service teachers or in-service teachers about the kinds of signs and messages that are displayed at school. Yeah, so that's that's indeed a stereotype. Stereotype uh, stereotypes, sorry, uh, are kind of quite problematic often. And uh, actually, I think uh, that's one of the uh, benefits of, uh, for example, organizing the course conference at the end. Um, of the of the course, uh, so that uh, the students uh, present their projects to each other, and they also peer review each other's report, etc. Uh, so, actually, then there's uh, there are uh, critical comments. <laughs> for example, for if if there's a there's a project kind of uh, celebrating the idea of uh, of, for example, placing different flags in the classroom, etc., to make an intentional environment. And then I think that's the most powerful. That if uh, some peer students uh, comment on this, that uh, that hey, so it would be good to consider if it's if it's okay with all and are people happy uh, to be identified with some kind of um, identities, etc. So. Uh, and, and nationalities, etc., and then uh, yeah, also for example, in the in the translanguaging master's thesis that will uh, be launched uh, next year, um, there's there's this idea of of translanguaging, so starting uh, using a language which is not a language of instruction officially, but still kind of starting using that and. Uh, transforming the schoolscape so that it would be visible and it would be a knowledge. So these kind of transformations of language ideologies, how, how do they work and, uh, and how could they uh, be uh, enhanced? And not uh, only by, you know, the, the teacher uh, finding out some interesting idea and applying, but asking the, the learners first what would be comfortable, what would be interesting to share and then 
Um, and then going on, if you remember Agnes's idea, uh, Agnes's uh, example that I showed, first uh, she, for example, uh, focused a lot on on uh, symbolic symbols of of France, and uh, then mm, she, she writes in her report later in the follow up that uh, that uh, her her pupils had so many other ideas. So, so she kind of expanded the original idea, not not uh, to focus so much on on France, for example. So that's also quite quite interesting to see. Of course, at the same time, there are the structural issues that, for example, uh, designing a separate classroom for teaching a separate language kind of also compartmentalizes uh, language education. But that's another thing, and I don't believe that uh, uh, a solo teacher would have so much. Uh, impact on that. So that's that's another story of, of uh, structural changes. Thank you so much. Um, I, we have a we have a question that dropped in the Q and A, and we have another one in the chat. And I think it might be possible to combine the two. Um, so I'm going to give you a hard one here. <laughs> no. Okay. Um, first of all, the the chat or the Q and A question is. Um, do you think schoolscape pedagogy can help in advancing critical thinking skills? And I'll let that sit with you while I go to the chat and say, is it possible to explain what you mean uh, with building design skills in the use of environment as a uh, resource? Um, and I, yeah. thinking, so maybe combining the two. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that this uh, building uh, design skills of uh, of teachers means that, uh, for example, that that's been my experience that uh, students and, and also in service uh, teachers, when they start taking this course, uh, they don't necessarily have this kind of uh, uh, designer identity that they, they can reshape, for example, the classroom, uh, or that they could go beyond the, the routines, for example, that, uh, that they've uh, learned uh, during their formation years. So what what kind of elements we usually do in a classroom, the children's drawing, the national flag, etc. these kind of issues. But why do we do so? And do we need them? And if yes, then why and how? And if not, then, then what, to, what to do in a different way? So for example, that can be a critical reflection on these practices that they, they've absorbed during their, their formation years and, and their practices, etc. But then they need to kind of... Uh, redefine and understand again what what they do and why they do it so that's what i understood by uh, building uh, design skills and also it's it's very uh, practically uh, just a reference also to uh, design thinking uh, as a tool for educators and we actually uh, use a handbook a open access handbook uh, design thinking for educators which kind of gives hints and and contributes to the design skills of, uh, of the teachers. Um, and uh, part of that design thinking is, for example, that first you uh, listen to the community and, and ask uh, from mm -hmm. the learners. And that's, for example, uh, for some uh, participants, a big surprise that can really um, pupils be involved in, in a schoolscape design. Aren't they too small for this? Do they understand, etc.? But if you understand the logic of this design thinking, then you, you realize that, yes, you can ask. It's a valid thing to, to involve them in the design. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I want to thank you, uh, Tomas, for your time, uh, your contribution to this digital symposium. Although we couldn't uh, be face to face together, I did feel like I was having a cup of coffee with you and uh, and chatting. And I learned so much in this past this past hour. I'm really excited to to collaborate and have my students collaborate with you. I want to draw our participants' attention to the chat. Um, I see that Dr. Solmas dropped Dr. Sabo's email contact in the chat. And I, I'm wondering, uh, Dr. Sabo, if it's okay with you, if participants send you email questions um, as well, if we didn't get a chance to ask Yeah, them. sure. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I also shared uh, some links uh, in the um, chat that I used in the presentation. So if you're interested in those projects and resources, you're welcome. Thank you so much. Mm, yeah.